Hello everyone, thank you for coming once again to the uh, ABD seminar series. Uh, today it is my pleasure to introduce you to Jose Manuel de los Reyes González. Uh, he is a postdoc here at the ABD. Uh, he studied biology in the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid and then he moved to Barcelona where he did his PhD. Um, uh, he works with birds, especially in population uh, monitoring and, and tracking birds uh, uh, to study their ecology and their behavior. Uh, and today he's going to talk about uh, his work. Um, and he's currently a postdoc at DVD working in, in some HAL project. Uh, so whenever you're ready. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, hello, thanks for coming. Uh, I will give the, the talk in English. But first, uh, I apologize because I, I know it's not so good, but I will do my best. Um, and yeah, it's, it's good for me also because I'm new here and, and I have recently joined the, the, um, the ABD. Um, I'm going to work in, in, in the same that I have been working in the last 10 years. It, 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 this is uh, using biologging to study seabirds. So this is the cover of my, of my PhD thesis. Um, and help me to introduce the, the talk. So seabirds, and I'm going to talk later about them, uh, live at sea, and then we have a, a challenge to study the, the at sea ecology of these, of these animals. So in the talk, I'm mostly going to address three, three, three topics, but I'm not going, I'm, I'm not going to uh, go deep in any ecological question just is, is to show you uh, these three things that we can address using these techniques that without them we, we cannot even start <clears throat> so these three questions where where the seabirds go how they behave and what do they face what do they encounter when they are wandering in the oceans so this talk is about oceans. Uh, just uh, I don't know. Many of you, I think, are working in terrestrial ecosystems. So, just two tips about about the oceans. <clears throat> the oceans are not. They apparently are homogeneous, but they are extremely dynamic and heterogeneous. Okay, there, there are islands, shelf breaks, sea mounds, eddies, upwellings, and other features that make this this uh, environment really dynamic. And also the oceans are in danger. Probably the most uh, important threat nowadays is the climate change, followed by overfishing and also other threats like pollution or invasive species. Seabirds, we are going to talk about seabirds. Probably most of you know these, these species or you know what is the seabird because of the uh, this charismatic group of, of birds, the, the albatros. The albatros is the, the wandering albatros with 3.5 meters of wingspan. And they are very really famous also because wisdom, this female of lights and albatros that has more or less 70 years old now. And also, for example, penguins are really, really famous because of the films and, and because they don't fly. But Within the seabirds, we have a lot of, of variety. This is like a like an ecological guild. It's not a phylogenetic group, and and all of them share uh, very very different shapes, very different size, very different uh, body structure. But all of them share these life history traits. They are top predators. They show and a slow development, they have low reproductive rates, they have delayed maturity, they have a great long longevity, and they have high adult su survival. <clears throat> but above all, all of them depend or highly rely on the, on the oceans, on the, on the marine environment to, to survive, to, to find food. Also, the seabirds are, are considered sentinel species in the, in the marine environment because they are uh, good as as model species to, 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 to track what is happening in this marine environment. Because they integrate the processes that are happening in lower trophic levels, they react quickly to environmental variability, especially with, with the, the changes in behavior. They are abundant, they are conspicuous, they are visible at sea. They are highly, highly philopatric, so they always come to the same breeding colony and also to the same nest. 
to breed year after year. They are accessible in this uh, breeding sites in the in the on land, but mainly in islands and islets. And they are easy to, to sample and monitoring. They have evolved in, in Iceland without predators, and more or less they are easy to catch and easy to study. But also, seabirds, because the, the oceans are threatened, seabirds are, are also under threat. So they are probably the avian group with uh, most number more number of species uh, in decline in decline. And these are the the factors, the, the, the main threats, no? the, the invasive species in the island, the bycatch, which is the, the accidental capture of, of this species when fishing boats are operating, the hunting, the, the climate change, the, well, I'm going through this, the disturbance, the, the pollution, and the uh, fishing, um, and the, the stock, the, the fishing, uh, the, <laughs> I mean, less food in the oceans because of the fishing activity. Traditionally, the, the seabirds have been studied uh, using these this, uh, two approaches to know where they go from coastal observations, people scoping uh, up the sea to, to, to count bears or to identify or, or to know where, where they are crossing, and also from boat observation in, in vessels. To, to know well, the abundance and, and so on. But with this approach, we have a really important uh, limitation that is that we don't know the origin of the birds that we are counting, that we, that we are seeing. So we cannot relate what we are seeing with the life traits of the, of the individuals. The other approach, our traditional approach is the, the ringing, the scientific ringing that all you know here for sure know what is this. But in the case of the seabirds, the, there are very low uh, recovery rates out of the breeding colonies because it's very difficult to, to find some of these birds in other places because they are wandering in the, in the ocean. <clears throat> so for example, just to show you, this is the map of what we uh, knew 20 years ago about the migration of the, of the water that is the species that I'm going to talk in later. So everything is with uh, interrogants and, and very um, very lazy, very very fussy patterns. So we really didn't know that much about the migration of these species. The traditional approach to study how they behave is more or less this this um, this this way, no? It's, Focal observation. So you put there and you observe the animals and take notes of what, what they are doing. And this could be um, uh, useful for, for species, for, for example, coastal species. But again, we cannot relate what we are observing with the rest of the life history traits of individuals. And also, you can imagine that doing this with the species that are uh, searching for food in the middle of the ocean could be very, well, it's not feasible. So here comes the biologging into play. Biologging, this is the definition of the, of the term by the International Biologging Society, is the use of electronic devices attached onto or something inserting into an animal to record in a memory biological, physical, and or environmental parameters as a function of time so that we scientists can reconstruct the activity of the animals, the characteristics of the environment in travels in, that they travel in, and the interaction between the two. It's, I think it's important to, 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 to know that biologging is different from biotelemetry because the biologging of the biologers, the devices, are um, recording the information on board. Okay? But it is true that since the mobile phone industry has, has uh, exploded, has contributed to, to boost the, the improvement in biologging because now the devices can store the information but can send using, uh, for example, the telephone, the mobile phone network 
can send the, the data stored on board. So this is the like uh, evolution of, of some of the devices used, used to study seabirds. The probably most important point was when uh, geolocators appeared in the starting of the of this uh, of the 2000 or 2002. I don't remember. Um, then the the GPS start to go uh, to reduce the size, and then also the the accelerometers because also because the the mobile phones uh, promote this this use of accelerometers they reduce the price the size and, and now we can use also in these devices in the in the biology in, uh, research also maybe some of you know about geolocators because are really used today with terrestrial birds the, the most tiny ones are now like 0 0.6 grams and can be used in in in, in passerine birds so yeah they say they, they, the terrestrial uh, birds uh, or researchers using uh, studying terrestrial birds have uh, take advantage, have took advantage of this uh, revolution of geolocators coming from the from the um, from the researchers working with marine animals. I didn't say before that the first, yeah, the first biolog bi biologing device was uh, used in, in, in this in 1963. Uh, and it was, it was like a combination of a, a kitchen clock with another thing in a, in a water sea to study the, the, how they go uh, to the deep ocean to, to, to search for food. One important thing about the, the seabirds is that for most of the species, we cannot use harness. Maybe someone here is studying uh, raptors, for example, and it's common in raptors that you use a harness to put the device on the back, and then you do not need to, to, to recapture the bird because the, the data is uh, downloaded using satellites or using the mobile phone network. But in, in these species, because they, most of them, they dive and they change the volume of the body, we cannot use the, cannot use the harness because this compromises the welfare of the, of the individuals. So we are forced to use another kind of devices that we need to recover later. So this is a problem, but as I told you before, the, the sievers, most of the species you can go at the colony are uh, and more or less easy to recapture the birds, okay? <clears throat> I'm going too fast or it's okay? Okay. So also we have new tools today that can combine with biologin. Uh, one of them is, is the, the use of remote sensing. This is an animation, but I think, can I switch off? <clears throat> so today we can basically, oof, no se ve nada, verdad? Well, <laughs> this is like the, the net primary productivity in the in the ocean that that the bird uh, encounter during that the, during that foraging trip. So uh, you, you are not seeing the, the dark colors, but the dark colors is the, is, uh, are the lowest uh, values in this scale, and the the yellow ones are where most uh, where, where more uh, productivity the bird encounter during the during the trip. So today we can. Uh, <clears throat> Couple, we, we, we can label directly the position of the birds with the environmental conditions that were in that specific moment at that time where the bird was there searching for food or resting or commuting or flying to, to a different place. 
and that is thanks to remote sensing. For example, in this animation, you can see the, the, the sea surface temperature uh, changing over the Atlantic Ocean in a time series. Okay, you don't say, I know it's nada, no? Está por todo. Sí. <clears throat> okay. Probably the, the cyber groups is, 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 I would say, the one that has most uh, benefit from the violin research. This, in this plot, you can see the exponential uh, growth of, of uh, numbers of species uh, tracked with, with biologin. Now, at this moment, in, two, in 2020, uh, 50, uh, 50 million of uh, positions. This could come from geolocators of, or uh, GPS and uh, more than or almost 200 uh, species uh, tracked by researchers. Another example to, to make you realize of this uh, bloom of studies in cyber research using biologin. This is the data from the cyber tracking database. That is a collaborative effort of, of people researching uh, with cyber that contribute to this uh, Bird Life International platform to put all the data together and use this data for uh, different purposes, such as uh, conservation or definition of marine protected areas and so on. So this was the picture in 2004. And this is the picture in 2017. As you see, now all the entire oceans are covered with this technology. Fieldwork, how we work doing fieldwork with this species. Obviously, it, it depends on the, on the species. By the way, I'm talking this talk uh, about pelagic seabirds, okay? More or less, you have to put apart in your head gulls in this case. We are talking about pelagic seabirds. And for example, to work with the shearwaters, that are, are the species that I, has, uh, I have been working the most, uh, we have to go to the island. We have to, to move in this kind of, of, of uh, land, that is uh, badlands, uh, cliffs and, and volcanic or karstic uh, rocks, and get into the nest. It is uh, it's in speed faster, but entering the coves and trapping the the birds. I used to work mostly during the nights, which which make it a bit harder because depending on the on the uh, moment of the breeding period, they they behave different. And sometimes we have to do the work during the night, sometimes during the day. These are, as they, are, they need to catch the, the fish. You can imagine this, this big is sharp. This is a GPS uh, deployed on the back. This is like a reflectant, reflectante, reflectant tape to find in, in the dark. And this is the cliff. So which devices we normally use, or at least the, the two that I have been using most. One is the one are the GPS loggers. All of you know the, the GPS um, satellite uh, system. So we use these small devices like uh, 18 or 20 grams. Um, put them in the bag of the birds. And as I told you, this, this they are really really light, really small, but we need to, to catch again the bear. We need to catch, to catch it first to put the, 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 the device and we need to recover after the well, after the, the time that the bear takes to, to make some foraging trips to recover and, and, and catch and, and catch the, the device and took samples of blood or, or feathers or whatever. So this GPS has uh, have a short battery life, one or two weeks. This, this means that if the bird is taking one day to go, uh, to go out and, and come back, we can have like two or 14, uh, for example, 14 um, foraging trips. But if the bird takes 20 days out of the nest foraging, 
then we will have like a cut uh, for eigentrip. We have the risk of uh, drop off because we are touched with Tesla tapes in the back with, with, uh, to the feather. So we have the risk that the, the, the device fall off. And the good thing is that they, they are light. Uh, they have like uh, high spatial temporal resolution. They are cheap, which means that we can have a large sample size and they don't need a harness to be deployed. The other device is the what we what we call uh, global location sensors, the geolocators. Basically, with these uh, small devices, three grams devices here, we put them in the in the in the leg with a plastic ring, and these devices collect the the light of the day, the time in in universal time, universal coordinated time, and with these two things, we can derive uh, later the position with an error or more or less 200 kilometers, but this error is enough to track in the entire Atlantic Ocean where they go. Uh, they need also to be uh, recovered uh, to download the information. And we have with these two information by, by day, two daily, sorry, two daily positions by day. Also, another important thing of these devices is that they have a long battery life. They have like a clock uh, battery, so they, they can uh, last for, for even three or four years, some models. And they, have, uh, they are also cheap. So again, we can have large sample sizes. And they are normally used for, uh, to study the around movements. And was one important thing of these devices is that they have a wet dry, wet dry sensor or immersion sensor. So this help us to study how they behave in the open ocean in the open ocean after the breeding season. So we put this during the breeding season, they leave, they go to the winter in areas and we can know how they behave there. So with this information that is a continuous register, I mean every change to put the, the leg on water to put it out we re record this so we can reconstruct information in a very highly detailed and this uh, allow us to infer the activity the phenology the annual cycle the annual life cycle and circadian rhythms i will go later again to this but now some i will show some examples of uh, application of these um, these technologies so the first question that i said before where do the uh, cybers go and what can uh, what can we unveil with this information? One example is this, this work that we published in a, in a book in 2017, where we sum up uh, more than 1 million tracking positions, more than 1,500 uh, foreign trips, more than 300 uh, year round uh, migrations coming from almost 500 individuals, six years of data, and covering all the distribution range of these species in the in, in spain no? in, including Can canary islands uh, chafarinas um, the balearic archipelago uh, some colonies in, in galicia and some colonies in the levantine coast these species uh, are probably most of the, the of maybe the most charismatic of pelagic seabirds in, in spain the coris and the scopolis waters they are really similar they were split in two different species a few years ago but they were they used to be considered the same species. The first thing that we can study with this, obviously, is the individual foraging movements and, and how um, how birds from different colonies uh, segregate or overlap in a space, which obviously can have uh, applications for management. We can also focus in, 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 in some places. For example, if we focus in the Canary Island system and in Gran Canaria, if you don't know the system, this is a very important upwelling where the esterly winds uh, promote uh, the surgence of, of cold water from the deep. And then it's a very rich environment. So we have been working here for the last 10 years in with the Corisir waters, tracking the bears there. And one of the things that we can also address with biologging and would be impossible without this technique 
is to study the interannual consistency of foraging grounds. So in this, uh, for example, these um, six years, you can see more or less the pattern of, of, of tracks. Some, some years they go down, some years they take more to the north. We can uh, analyze more in deep these uh, kernel areas and check what is the most important area used over the year. This is the, the kernel overlap, the 50% kernel overlap over this period. But we can also address what is the, the importance at, at individual and also link it to population level. So in this, in this plot, I'm not feeling bad because I'm giving the shoulder all the time. In this uh, plot, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this, uh, this short plot indicates, for example, in this, this part, you have the years. And this is the proportion of, of all the foreign trips from different individuals that uh, we record that year and how they um, segregate between the different latitudinal ranks. Okay, so here uh, I am considering the, the foraging area as the centroid of the kernel of the foraging uh, areas used during each foraging trip in the, in the African coast. So one or two important conclusions. One is, okay, this is the, the most important area, is, is the, the most used by the birds. But for example, some years, I mean, I'm talking about this because this year, this area was proposed as an important bird area to, to, to try to protect it as a marine, a marine protected area for, for birds. But some years, if you look at 2011, uh, the importance in areas apparently, apparently not so much, not so important, were more important because that year, for example, the the easterly winds were not so strong, were were, were uh, uh, weak. So as the upwelling was uh, less strong, uh, birds were forced to go down to the southeast. So this most uh, so to the southern part of this upwelling uh, to 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 find for food. So so depending of the of the environmental condition every year, the the areas used differ, and we can address this uh, with uh, with biologin. If we go if we move into the geolocators, we can use them to study migratory strategies. In this uh, book that I told you before, we also the, describe the the individual strategies of these uh, two species, we found that they, they, they use like seven different uh, for, uh, wintering areas, depending on the individual. I have shown here uh, only four, but they have even more different strategies. So we, we can address individual uh, differences in the, in, the, in the path that they took in the areas where, we, where they spend the, the winter and also uh, in the phenology at individual level. So, voila, this is matrix. Wow. Yeah, just to show you this animation, how, the, how they move, they, they, they usually, I don't know why this is happening, this, this matrix. They they do like a, a loop in the in the Atlantic, but every indi each individual take more or less different um, phenology and different paths. Uh, other thing that we can address is to 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 evaluate the importance of each uh, different wintering area for each breeding colony where we have been uh, tagging birds, and we can also other. Uh, I mean, these, these are like the relative importance of each of these areas to the total uh, tracked population. And we can also, at the individual level, evalu evalu uh, individu uh, by individuals, but at the population level, evaluate the winter inside fidelity. So you can imagine that th these birds move across vast extension in the, in the ocean. I mean, it is, for me, at least, it's curious that they, uh, high, they have a really high within individual overlap. Uh, between years in the areas that they are using. So this means that they are knowing where they are despite 
in the middle of the ocean, it is hard to know where you are. We can also evaluate the migratory connectivity. So we can know um, how important each uh, winter in area, these sectors in the, in the middle, in the down middle part, represent each uh, winter in area. And these are the breeding colonies. So we can evaluate how important is each colony, each winter in area for each colony, and also how the individuals from the different uh, breeding colonies mix or not in these winter in areas. Okay, this was in this work. So, but if you take this idea, we can scale this analysis and publish a super paper as Martin Bill uh, did uh, this year, where a lot of, of research group, um, uh, research groups uh, put our data there and evaluate how important is the, the water from each um, country to birds coming from, from all the breeding colonies uh, that uh, were tracked. So this, this work taking more than 10,000 10, tracks, almost 6,000 6, individuals, uh, seven, uh, 87 breeding uh, localities, and almost 40 species, different species of albatros, shearwaters, and petrels to put numbers in the importance uh, of, of the different regions and the uh, responsibility of the different countries to protect the areas where, they, where these uh, birds are, are spending the winter. So the next question, how do they behave and one, uh, one, what can we unveil with this information? If you remember this slide, I told you about these uh, wet dry sensors that allow uh, allow us to to reconstruct the the behavior if it put or not the the leg in the water. This means is, is, if the if the record is dry, probably the bird out of the breeding period is flying because these birds only goes to the breeding colony during the breeding period. Okay, out of this period, they are always wandering the in the ocean. So if the if the record is dry, they are flying. If the record is wet, they are or resting in water or uh, diving to catch fish. And if we find dry, wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, they are foraging, like searching for food. Uh, then I try to catch a, a fish, then I fly it again, and so on. So with this simple information, we can reconstruct at this detail the entire uh, annual cycle of a bird. For example, in this case, this is the, the proportion of uh, by day the proportion of, of wet and dry. And this is like um, grouping or zooming the information by 10 minutes blocks, okay? This is like a raster. Each cell is a 10 minutes, minutes block with this proportion of dry to wet, okay? So we can do this. We can know exactly without having seen the bird, we can know exactly when during the breeding period, where, 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 when was the, the nest attendance, when, the, was, uh, the, when were the, the incubation stints, nocturnal visits to the, to the nest. We can see during the wintering period that is this part of here when they were resting or when they, for example, it is th this, these lines here, they mean they are flying and this is uh, the sunset and the sunrise. So they are really active during sunset and, sun, and sunrise because they are flying in this moment to commute to the foreign areas, okay? We can also relate the activity patterns with the, the moon cycle. For example, in this case, that is a different species, the Teratroma inserta, the Atlantic petrel. This bird breeds in the, in the subantarctic ocean in the mm, Tristan da Cunha archipelago, uh, there is a clear match between the moon uh, cycle and the activity pattern of the birds. So there is almost two hours of difference uh, in, the, in the birds uh, spending uh, time in water or flying, depending on the, of the moon phase. Um, Yeah, just to say, for example, if, if, if you imagine that, that these birds are 
uh, searching for fish that, that are close to the surface um, but make uh, dial vertical migrations. Probably during the, the, the moon full, uh, these fish not tend to go so close to the surface, so it's more difficult to catch them. So during the moon phase, there is more visibility to birds, so they can fly, but they are forced to fly more to try to catch first the uh, fish. We can also infer carryover effects with this information. This is the case of the same species, the, the Pterodoma inserta. And in this study, we, we found evidence of uh, carryover effects. This species suffers a lot, a lot, a lot, from mice predation in this, in this island. So the mice uh, predate on eggs and chicks, and then they cause a very high uh, breeding uh, failing of these birds. So with this information, uh, with the activity patterns uh, coupled with um, movement uh, information from the geolocators also, we, we, can, we could characterize the onset of the chick breeding, the, on the onset of the, of the post-breeding migration, the, on the onset of the non-breeding, and so on, so different, different uh, phenological moments. And we found that um, there is a, a clear um, impact of uh, what is happening in the in the nest because of this predation impacts what the birds are doing later in the in the different phenological events. Another thing that we can do, we can reconstruct like behavioral landscapes. So it's putting in the in the in a geographical context the the information of this. Um, of these uh, activity patterns. It is, in this case, this is called the night flight index, which means how the how nocturnal are the individuals or not. The darker the color, the more nocturnal they are in these wintering areas. So, for example, despite all of these are birds coming from the same breeding colony, they they diverge in the in the wintering areas. But also, if you look at this. When they winter in the Brazilian waters, they are really diurnal. Meanwhile, when they are uh, wintering in the uh, Madagascar Channel in the Indian Ocean, they are more nocturnal. Okay, so there is also uh, like uh, I mean, I just give you briefly some of these points, but every of these stories you can go more in deep and analyze wh why they are behaving uh, different. Again, if we scale this information up to a multi-species approach, we can uh, characterize for the entire uh, global oceans, what is the, the behavior, the nocturnal or diurnal behavior of uh, different uh, groups of these uh, seabed species. For, for example, this, is, this was recently published two weeks ago. We also, we also contribute with data to this work. And here you can see the, the entire pattern of this nocturnality in, in sheer waters, in Pterodroma petrels, in escuas, in, 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 nocturnal, in exclusively nocturnal species, and so on. And now we move to the GPS again to study behavior. In this case, we use uh, machine learning algorithms to to apply unsupervised clustering. And the CIFR, what were they doing during the foraging trips? Uh, normally, these uh, algorithms take uh, two variables. That could be uh, speed and turning angle or uh, length step and turning angle. And with these two simple metrics, we can infer if the birds were uh, traveling, which is the, the, dark, the dark blue, if they were searching for food, uh, making intensive search, which is the, the red one, if they were uh, like doing a, an area restricted search, so foraging, but in a more lazy way, or if they were uh, commuting. So with this uh, simple metrics that take machine learning as a supplementary tool, we can reconstruct the, or, or again, label the, the, the behavior at each GPS point where what was the bird 
uh, doing. And if we translate this individual approach to the population approach, we can again uh, make uh, the tiled behavioral landscapes. Uh, in this case, remember, this is during the breeding season, but at least when we can use these GPS loggers because we, we need to recapture them. And uh, we can, for example, evaluate the, the, again the nocturnality or, or, or if they were uh, behaving in this, in this way during the night or during the, the day. You can see the very different pattern in, in day and in night. And also we can evaluate uh, in, in what was the most important behavior at each of the grids, uh, the grid uh, cells. This is like the same information, but uh, with a different data visualization to, to, to put the, the focus on, on, the, on the breeding colony. This, this case is different. These are, these are the three uh, national parks in Spain where this species breed. So the central point of the circles are the, the the national park or the, the colony in the national park and, and we can let's say compare in a more um, uh, objective uh, way the, the differences in the in the distribution in these three uh, 360 degrees uh, plots the distribution of the different behaviors we can also evaluate the behavioral budgets that means uh, how the the animals allocate time to these different behaviors. So, uh, for example, we can evaluate uh, how mm, or, or, or why the uh, how the individuals um, modify the behavior uh, as the breeding period advances. So, the, the the breeding constraints change over the breeding period, and they need to uh, relocate uh, the, the time invested invested in every different behavior. Okay, so these ternary plots and this kernel density surface here are more or less informing about this. They, they at, at the start, they rest more and foraging less. And when they have the cheeks, uh, <laughs> uh, mm, calling the, the parents for food, the, the adults uh, spend more time foraging and, and very low time resting, I think it's as the human do. Huh? And the last part that I would like to show you is, uh, is about this question, what do they face? And I uh, mean with this, how they deal with the environment, how they, how they move, how they behave, and how they um, yeah, face the, the different conditions that they can encounter during the, the trips. In, in this case, I mean, environmental conditions, but also human-related uh, activities. So probably most of you know that the fishing activity, uh, uh, the human fishing activity is very high in the oceans. It's, a, it's the second threat that I told you at the start of the talk. This is an animation showing how the, the entire or the global fishing fleets uh, move or the activity patterns of the fishing, the global fishing uh, fleet behaves. It's, it's coming from the global fishing watch um, platform or application. Uh, yeah, th there are two main problems associated with um, fishing activity. One is bycatch, and this case is the one albatross, but also all of these are sheer waters. This, this, this picture is taken here in, in Spain. And the other is the, the overfishing. So it is important to evaluate the relation between the seabirds and, and fishing activity. Uh, as I told you, this picture is, is taken here in, 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 Bar in Barcelona. Uh, this is the Scopoli seawater. It's a, an endemic species uh, from the from the Mediterranean, they, they winter in, outside of the Mediterranean, but they, they breed here and are endemic to the Iceland in the, in the Mediterranean Sea. And this is the species that is most uh, affected by, by bycatch in the Mediterranean. It's the most uh, catchy species uh, when, the, when the long liners are operating. And also there's another important problem with this is that the, the, there's a 
a sex ratio, a different sex ratio in the mortality. So uh, males are more trapped than, than females. So we did this, uh, this study to evaluate uh, or to try to evaluate how these birds, in this case, birds from, from Menorca, which is the Calamorel, is the most important breeding colony of this species in the Balearic archipelago and, and in, in Spain. It's estimated in, in six, uh, between 1,000 and 6,000 individuals. And we combine here uh, very different sources of information. The first one is the the machine learning approach that I told you before, using uh, this uh, mm, technique to, to make behavioral annotations. So we can know at each uh, point of the tracks, what are they doing? But we also combine this information with the vessel monitoring system. The vessel monitoring system is like, a, it's like using biologging with vessels. So we can know where the vessels uh, were operating more or less every two hours, a fix every two hours. So what we made for, was uh, first to, to know what, were, what was the behavior at each point, and then uh, cross or merge these two sources of information. So we, we applied an algorithm to evaluate if the bear was doing foraging close to, the, to a um, fishing vessel in a specific uh, angle within the beating of the vessel. So a lot of things to find without being there that the birds were interacting uh, at that time with the, with the fishing vessel, okay? Uh, we also evaluate in this case the, the environmental uh, pattern with this uh, global index, the, the North Atlantic Oscillation Index that most of you probably know. And this index uh, could be negative or positive and depending on this, the environmental conditions change a lot and this means that could be more or less uh, abundance of food in the in the marine system so uh yeah this is just to show you this these four years uh the, we found like a different pattern of where the these interactions happened uh and also the the relation between foraging trips that remain close to the archipelago and, and, and the proportion of trips that uh, commute to the Catalan Sea, to the Catalan coast. So this was the first year, this was the second year. If you, if you look here, you can see that uh, depending of the year, the, the amount of trips going to this area uh, differs. And this was the, the last year. So this, this was a study with 635 tracks or foreign trips. And we found basically that this, this was uh, contrary to was, uh, my initial expectation. I was thinking that, okay, if there is a, um, a lot of food in the ocean, probably the birds would not uh, tend to follow the vessels because they have like the natural food. We, we found just the opposite. So as much, um, and also if there is a good year with productivity and a lot of fish, then you will find more fishing vessels operating, okay? So we found that the more fishing vessels operating, oops, operating in, the, in the area, the more the birds tend to attend the, the vessels. So there is more risk of bycatch during the good years than during the bad years when there is less food in the ocean. And we also found that uh, males, uh, the probability of a male attending a fishing vessel was double than the females. So the, the bycatch rate that we know from previous studies is likely related with this fact that, that birds tend to, to attend more vessels. And this is probably related because birds are larger not so much, but larger, and then make a uh, displays to females from these uh, results. Also, we found uh, relating this information with a uh, stable asset of analysis from plasma, that uh, the more time 
a bird attend a vessel, more uh, signal of using uh, fishing discards uh, we found in the in the plasma. So this is a an evidence that birds are following this this um, these vessels trying to catch this easy food that are the fishing discards. And we also found a different uh, foraging effort. I mean, uh, if the year is uh, with poor conditions, uh, birds tend to increase more the foraging effort. And also this pattern, uh, uh, regardless of the, of the year of the annual conditions, females always had to invest more in foraging. Okay, this is all. Just to say that this was my previous uh, working team, the Cyber Ecology Lab in the University of Barcelona, uh, led by Jacob Gonzalez Solis. And now I am here to apply my expertise in this new project, the Zoom Hall project. There is like a sub project inside the Zoom Hall where we are going to, to track these three species to try to relate their behavior and movement with the human activity, most, uh, mostly focus on this uh, fishing, uh, human fishing activity, but also with uh, other uh, human structures such as uh, landfills and so on that are uh, used by, by gulls. So I'm sorry because I think I have been more time than expected, and I hope you understand my English, and that's all. All right, great. Thanks, Jose. Um, super interesting and really great visualizations. I really, really enjoyed how you presented the data. Um, yeah, any questions? We'll start off with questions here in the room and then we'll see if anyone's out, out there is asking anything. Yeah, thank you very much for your for your talk. I, I am curious for the phenological part. It's not you... working that, no? Uh, that's only for the... Oh, yeah. uh, uh. <laughs> so for the phenology, you, you said that the... Um, According to the breeding to the breeding place where the birds were, they were changing the phenology. They were having more nocturnal or more diurnal. But that phenology is the time where things are happening, and nocturnal or diurnal is behavior. I mean, what are you talking about now? Yeah. <laughs> so, are you mixing two different things? Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe the two of them. So the. Um, because also the timing of the behavior is, is, is phenology, yeah. right? Yeah. So, and I was wondering why they are changing their behavior and also the, I'm, but the you are relating the two, no? Probably yeah. this is, this is uh, related with the, the dynamic of the environment where they finally winter. I mean, if you arrive to a place later or, or sooner, the, the the latitude is different in that place and the productivity is different in that place so uh, behavior may change because the productivity patterns that they found there uh, change according to the date where they are arriving there when they are arriving there okay <laughs> so I, it was more for the paper you had a paper and I, I have the notes here the uh. um, that one in uh, 2019, you were putting a picture and you were having the... <clears throat> Pastor Prieto et al. So, you mean this one? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> this one? No, not that one. The, the other one with the, with, the, with the map of the different breeding areas. And then this one, this yeah. One? Yeah, so I found very curious that the Brazilian breeding animals are more diurnal, diurnal than the other ones. And do you have any clue why? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's because the, 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 the way this, this marine system, the, this is the, the Brazilian current, and this is the encounter of the Malvinas current 
facing the, the, the Brazilian current. The, the, the way this system works is very, is really different the way this system uh, works. This is, for example, influenced, influenced by the Amazonas uh, Plum River and the uh, subantarctic um, waters coming from the south. Uh, it's very different from this uh, more typical, typical upwelling system from the Namibia current going up. So the, the phenology of the system, not the birth, the phenology of the system regarding uh, productivity is different. And also the way they, this uh, oceanographic uh, system works, uh, work is very different. So the behavior of the birds are probably related with the way the systems uh, work. But okay, so but you don't understand well why they are more. I mean, I know the systems are different. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. But we, can why... go, we can go deep in that. This means that the species uh, living here are probably more diurnal. The species, I mean, the pre, the prey species. Ah, for the... So they are uh, preying on, on a species with diurnal pattern. Meanwhile, in this case, they are uh, feeding on nocturnal species that do uh, dial vertical migration. So they get close to the surface water during the night. So birds are forced to work during the night to catch the fish. Meanwhile, in this part, they can do uh, work in the boat. Okay, great, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, you. You say that the ma uh, male was more caught during the prey by the human? Was more the, the male. Was more? You say, what? <laughs> Sorry. The male the, was more You say what? that seabird male were more caught than female? More what? Sorry. Ca okay. Ca capturado? <laughs> Trapped? <laughs> capturado? Uh, ah, by, by, from bycatch, you mean? Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And did Double. you know why? And also, did you have a difference in the sex ratio when you catch and recapture the... I can't understand you with the mask, an, an accent. In <laughs> <laughs> uh, Spanish? Yes, vale. Um, uh, bueno, la primera parte es para saber si, si sabes por qué los machos uh, tienes más mortalidad que las hembras y si también tienes uh, una um, difer diferencia en el sex ratio cuando vas a capturar o los... Uh, okay. So to the first question, that's all? The moment. <laughs> <laughs> to the first question, I, I tried to explain that. Uh, uh, we, we found that males are always uh, more attending vessels. If you, it means why they are more attending vessels, it's not that the females are not attending vessels, it's that the females are displaced by the males, okay? Okay. We also know that because other studies from other different research teams in, in Italy, where they use uh, also accelerometers, and they found that the, the birds and the, the females, uh, let's say, uh, fight less under, uh, behind a vessel than males. So they males to, to catch the face and, and, and females. Uh, and the other question, yeah, we always try to, to get a 50 50 sex ratio when we are tagging bears. So, and, yeah, but and, and no, it is there. So it's 50 50. I mean, more. there's no difference in the behavior of, um, but of male or female. I mean, when, when, some, when, they, when, the, can... when they come to the colony and we catch them, you mean? Yeah, we catch them. The probability of, of capturing them is the same. It's the same. So yeah. there's no difference in the behavior no because no, no, no. yeah some species may are more easy no, they, 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 because of the behavior. they attend the same to the to the ns they they spend the same time uh incubating they spend the same time yeah, yeah. Uh, taking so at least care you don't of have the root a, a bias in uh the bias is in mortality but yeah, yeah not course, in the not in, in the behavior the rest of life history threat at least for, yeah for dynamic population yeah. models yeah, okay well, thank you <clears throat> Any more questions? When you were tagging the animals inside of their refuges, uh, did inside you find when you when you when you were capturing the the albatrosses and the other seabirds in their in, inside of their of their nests? Uh -huh. Did you find any other any other fauna like hematophagus fauna, for yeah. example, bats or, or no, bats? Not bat ticks. 
a lot of ticks. Yeah. Of I, I found a lot, yeah. <laughs> and they found you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, I have a question regarding the blood analysis that you did to know what they were eating. Could you elaborate yeah, yeah, a little can, bit yeah. more? I, I, I didn't enter in detail here because this is about the biologging, but obviously we, we, we put all the pieces of the puzzle in, in, in the table, or at least all the pieces that we can, to, to reconstruct what they were eating and feeding on. And yeah, we, we, we work a lot on stable isotope of analysis. One more in the front. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, if I understood correctly, you talk about long liners, right? Palangre. Uh -huh. Are the ones that are catching the birds? Because it makes no sense. I mean, are not the rasteros who catch Yeah, them? That's, that's the thing here. In, in the long lining is, um, well, first, the, the, the fleet is. Uh, very small compared with with uh, trawlers, and the bycatch uh, events are uh, rare events. So there are very few, but when they happen, they catch a lot of birds. For example, 500 birds in one fishing fleet operation. So it's very difficult to to get enough data from this fishing fleet. So in this work, we didn't disregard by uh, fishing guild. But um, we um, we found uh, I mean the the, the the footprint of of the trawlers in the diet of the birds because of uh, this uh, stable isotope or salt that I present. So is the trawler um, activity which is um, attracting the birds. But we know because other we, we published other study in the in, in, in scientific reports in what, 500 ago that I mean the two uh, different fishing fleets trawlers and, and long liners are sharing the same fishing um, caladeros the fishing uh, areas. These trawlers are very much um, abundant. When, but when they are not operating, then the birds move to the long liners. So for birds, it's like the same, but they don't uh, find the same resource. But there is a high risk of bycatch when the trawlers are not operating because they move to the... And this is happening in the same fishing areas. So, for example, this is a really important result about... A, managing the fishing fleet because if, if one of them is taking holidays one day and the long liners are operating this day then the risk of eye catch is really large okay um coming up to two o'clock so another quick question yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, thank, thank you, Jose Manuel. It's very interesting, very suggestive, your, your talk. Well, it's, it's my question is uh, arose to the Irene, Irene question before. Is because you have uh, commented that uh, uh, the currents, the temperature of the current, you have a cold current, uh, for instance, in Namibia or, for instance, maybe in Humboldt, may have a pattern uh, associated uh, get, that may differ from other warm currents. Uh, well, I don't know if it's if it's related. You you have to say something. You, you mean the, the fish fish behavior? You so mean the, the fish behavior related to the to the temperature to the of the temperature water? Because yeah. it's the term. So the, the question is that okay, you can you can predict, for instance, activity in other in other settings uh, by by the, examining all, only the temperature and the response to the fish. I don't know if you. You yeah, yeah I, I, you or other groups are, are yeah, working on that. I mean, I mean, this. I, I think this would uh, this give you for one week talking about this, and then I try to just briefly introduce some points. But for example, this geolocator also um, record temperature from the water, so we can relate uh, the environmental. Uh, I mean, using satellite data, we can relate the 
the, the, the temperature of the water from satellite, the temperature that was recorded by the bear and the behavior of the bear. So we can uh, go deep in this in these questions. Uh, and yeah, probably is is uh, I repeat again is is all this uh, temperature uh, issue also impacts the behavior of fish. Not only the behavior, I mean the, the movement of fish. For example, in Namibia, there is like a migration of of uh, this um, sardinella and sardine and these uh, pipelagic species. They move to the north and then they move to the south. This is uh, impacting the where the birds decide to winter. In this uh, Brazilian current, uh, I really I, I know more about that uh, upwelling system than the Brazilian system, but it's probably the, the behavior and the abundance and, and the and the yeah the behavior of the fish is different. Also, other things take place here. For example, uh, in this area, there is there are a lot of seabirds coming from the subantarctic area, albatrosses and petrels and so on that displays here, and they could also be nocturnal. So maybe because of uh, competition, they could be more diurnal here. It's another hypothesis, but we don't know at the moment. Okay, I think we'll we'll finish up here. So, um, any more pressing questions? Uh, direct them at at Jose directly uh, by his email. And thanks again for giving the talk. Really interesting. Thank you.